so uh, thanks for having me. All right, here we go. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Patrick Lang. I'm with a um, consulting firm named Certainty Management. Um, I'm the founder and the CEO of Certainty. And uh, we are what's called a profit consulting firm. Um, I'm an author. I'm a speaker. I've, uh, the last two books I did were international bestsellers focused on business and culture in business. One was a visionary CEO. There was another book that I was invited to be a part of called Mission Matters. And that's basically why I'm here today is because your missions matter. You're working hard to, to make them work. And um, I believe I can help. I have some ideas that I feel like could make a big difference in your efforts. Um, we all know that fundraising is challenging, right? It's a dilemma that we all face. It's We're all trying to do some good. We're trying to make a difference, but it's an uphill climb. Right, it's 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 hard, right? Some, some we may we may just be frustrated. Um, maybe we're more than frustrated. We're <laughs> we're ready to pull our hair out and string ourselves up. Um, I talked to a lot of fundraisers who are exhausted. Right, they're burned out. They're they're trying to do good, trying to contribute to good, trying to raise funding to do good. And um, and struggling, right? We kind of feel like we're moving down the road, but there's a big uh, boulder in the middle of the road, right? Or we're trying to leap the gap and trying to get to where we're going, but we're being held back. And just by a raise of hands, I mean, who feels that way? Anybody out there? Am I the only one who who feels that way? Probably not, right? If you're fundraising, you. You're 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 fighting the the fight the good fight. You're trying to make a difference, and yet it's hard. And yet we we can't we can't give up, right? These causes that we're working for are important. They're they're necessary, whether it's children or community or trafficking, anti-trafficking or veterans, right? We cannot give up. We have to we have to keep going. Um, if we don't do it, who's going to, right? So whatever the focus is for most of us, it isn't something that we're willing to fail at. It's more than just a job, right? It's a passion. It's a mission even. I think most of us on this call, if we're in nonprofit work, if we're in fundraising, it's it's a mission. It's more than just a job. I know Libby feels like that. She 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 bleeds nonprofit, right? She's, she's a... Uh, She's died in the wall. This is what she's committed her, her life to is helping nonprofits to succeed. And, and I think many of us feel the same way. We feel beholden to keep going, um, driven, inspired, uplifted, wh whatever you want to say. But personally, uh, working in the nonprofit space with people like you, with all of you out there, uh, it's one of the most inspiring things I've ever been a part of. Um, I think you're the best of the best. You're the you're the cream of the crop in our in our nation and in our cities, our communities. You're some of the most impressive, uh, inspiring, and extraordinary people that I've ever met. Uh, it's safe to say, though, that many of us are are frustrated, right? We're we feel like we're failing at fundraising, even when we do it well. We struggle because. Um, we wake up unemployed, as they say. In sales, we talk about salespeople make a sale and then they have to start over. The next day they wake up, they have to go out and make another sale. And fundraising is very much the same. You raise funds from one gala or from one donor, or you raise them one year, the next year you have to start over again and again and again. And, and I think it's safe to say that many of us feel uh, overwhelmed by it. We feel exhausted, maybe even burned out. Uh, not necessarily all the time, right? We have good tight days and bad tight days. Um, some days we have um, great things happen. We get a big donation. We have a great gal. It goes well. I mean, there's highs, right? I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm not saying it's all frustrating. It, there are definitely highs and lows. But 
my contention is that there are more lows and there have to be that it's we're, we, we make it harder than it needs to be um i believe that fundraising as we know it as most of us do it is a flawed system uh, we're using approaches that are outdated and methods that are to be quite honest maddening and they're 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 they drive us crazy <laughs> um we make everything better in life. Uh, not, uh, well, at least there's progress, right? Now, some of us would uh, would would uh, argue and say things aren't getting better. Inflation's going up, and and uh, uh, there seems to be a lot more disunity and things like that. But, but in a lot of areas, things continue to progress. You think about our medicine, our electronics, our computing. I mean, everything from our smartphones to chat GPT. I mean, there's amazing developments in progress being made even our movies right i look at a movie from today with the 4d and 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 or hd and 4k and and the special effects imax experience all these things it's come a long ways from where it was 20 years ago or 50 years ago so why doesn't our approach to fundraising progress in the same way why doesn't it get better easier and more effective. Why isn't it progressing like everything else seems to be? In a very real sense, my question for you, and I'll pose this question to start this whole conversation, is why are we still fundraising the same exact way we did 100 years ago? Because in a very real sense, many of us are. Everything else is progressing and getting more high tech and and, and more streamlined and 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 more efficient, why isn't fundraising as efficient or high tech or streamlined as it can be? I, I think it's an important question. Now, remember when I when I kind of bag on this topic, I'm not talking about the work you do um, in your nonprofit. You're saving kids, you're serving veterans, you're 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 working to improve our our planet, our schools, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, that is worthwhile service, and it is. It is valiant, it's important, and it's uplifting. And that's not what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying is, um, while it's what gets us up in the morning, the fundraising side of it is very difficult. Uh, I'm talking about the basic daily, day-to-day um, -day grind of trying to get money out of others again and again and again and again. And it's and it's an honest statement, I think, a fair statement that there is never enough funding, it seems. Right? The number one thing most nonprofits need, we talk to nonprofits every day all over the country, the number one thing they need is funding. And the more funding they have, the more good they can do. Um, it's a, uh, it's just, it's the nature of the beast, right? It's a fact. But imagine if um, there was a day where there was more funding than you needed each year. Imagine having unlimited funding uh, to accomplish your goals, to hire more help. I, I, imagine if you could do, you could spend all your time doing your work of serving in the ways that you're serving and not have to spend nine tenths of your time trying to raise money. So you could actually get around and have resources to actually do that work. What if you could flip the, the scale and spend 10% of your time fundraising or raising funding and 80%, 90% of your time actually doing the work? That is what is possible, I believe, with this approach that I'm going to be talking about today. You know, and that's the fun part, right? That's the fun part, the inspiring part. It's the it's the uplifting work that our organizations do. It's it's providing rather than, um, you know, it, it's providing help and service rather than spending our time on exhausting, never-ending, challenging efforts to just get money so we can go do it. Uh, you could hire more help. You could do more marketing. You could build your team, your brand, improve your systems. Uh, you could reinvest in your cause just as we we invest in our firm. Uh, in our companies and our families. Uh, imagine if you could spend, I mean, think about it as an analogy. What if you could spend 90% of your time with your loved ones and the things you love doing 
your hobbies, your passions, your church, your, your kids, and 10% of your time making money. That's the dream, right? That's the dream of having residual income, for example. Or, I mean, we know people who've been in insurance for 30 years, or they're a successful network marketer or a musician or, or something, and they're getting residual income coming in. They're getting royalties. They're living the dream. I have a friend um, by the name of Marlon Dubetz, and he's uh, he's been in the direct sales industry for 40 years. He's a retired Army colonel, uh, helicopter pilot, and he got into network marketing about 40 years ago, about 30 years ago. And now he makes about 80000 a month, speaks about two or three times a year at different events, and there's the time he lives on his ranch in Iowa, 150 acres, hunts and fishes most of the time. <laughs> Right, he's living the dream, at least for him. A lot of people they have different dreams, but he is living the dream, and that's and as as incredible as that sounds, and maybe even unbelievable, hard to imagine. I believe the same is possible in our nonprofits. That's a big claim, I know that, but it is possible, and I'm going to tell you today how it is. Okay, it's okay to admit that fundraising is hard. It doesn't mean you're doing it. Well, it may mean you're doing it wrong, but it doesn't mean you're abnormal, right? Uh, everyone is. Most people are. We're all struggling with this outdated, archaic system of trying to raise funds, and we all feel that way at times. Um, it's hard work. We have too little resources. Now, unless you're a national nonprofit like St. Jude's or American Cancer Society or someone like that, you know, they, 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 they get a lot of funding and they seem to have a lot more resources and they probably enjoy their jobs a lot more than a lot of us do. But, but you probably have more opportunity and resources than you realize. And that's one thing I'm going to talk about now. Now, even they, I think, um, feel like their job at times is very hard. They may have more resources. They may have more opportunity, but the job is difficult because it is never ending. And like I said, we wake up unemployed every day. Um, I'm, I've been in sales for 40 years, right? I have salespeople across the country, affiliates from coast to coast, I have clients in all 50 states. And I tell my salespeople every day that they should work and to build residual incomes, recurring incomes, just like royalties to a movie star. Um, what if you could create recurring income, growing, expanding revenue for your nonprofit, what if you could create a perpetual expanding major gift program where funding was coming into you 24-7, 365, even while you sleep? Can you even imagine? Okay, what else could you focus on? What, what more could you accomplish? What, how would your life change and your energy level and just your, your exhilaration, your exuberance, if you have packed it. You know, we ask uh, the same question. Uh, we asked in our firm the, the same question about college students. We know a lot of college students that we work with, and so many are stressed about school. They're stressed about student debt. They're getting good grades uh, and just surviving while they do so. A lot of them are working full-time and going to school full-time and burned out tired, exhausted, stressed, worrying that they'll end up with a degree and a bunch of debt and not be able to get a job. So there's a lot of uncertainty, right? Our company is named Certainty Management. So, so we are constantly working to help our clients create more certainty. With our college students, we came up with a program called the Certainty Fellowship that helps college students create income and recurring income in their spare time in and around their school schedule where they can actually enjoy their college experience without killing themselves to get through it. There's a lot of parallels between that program, which we call the Certainty Fellowship, and this program, which I'm going to I'm talking about today, which is called the Certainty Partners Program. I had a lot of parallels because we're both stressed. We're both overworked. We don't have enough resources. We're worried about the future. <laughs> so it's never, it, it's overwhelming. Um, we help our college students who are involved in the Certainty Fellowship to graduate 100% debt-free, uh, empowered, unencumbered, 
able to launch the rest of their lives inspired and prepared but back to fundraising you know it's tiring even for the development directors and philanthropy workers and others who work for the big institutions and the reason for that is that again i believe the system is flawed it has built in issues built in complexity and just elements of fatigue there's a concept in business in the world. We're all familiar with it. It's called planned obsolescence. When something is doomed to fail, or at least to get really old really fast, right? It, it reminds me a little of the of the planned obsolescence that we see manufacturers build into their products. As, I mean, you know, the, all the things we buy and consume. I mean, sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's built in. Sometimes it just happens. Uh, sometimes it's due to progress. You know, technology gets better. And so we we abandoned the old approaches, but did you know that in 1924, there was an international group of light bulb manufacturers. They met, um, it was called the Phoebus cartel. They agreed to limit life bulb spans to around a thousand hours, significantly shorter than the previous standard. They did it so that, that people would keep buying light bulbs, right? That's planned obsolescence. In 2001, Apple introduced their new iPod it came out with an irreplaceable battery that lasted only about 18 months. A lot of people were outraged about it. Planned obsolescence, right? They wanted you to have to buy another one. Well, we've all experienced things that fail, like our phones, computers, car tires, engines, and more. Other things just go out of style, like fashion. You know, there's the next version. We want the next model. And we see that in fashion, automobiles, hairstyles, video games. Okay. There's also positive obsolescence where some things become obsolescent and it's a good thing, right? Like technology getting better, like I said, uh, better medical practices, um, understandings, our kids growing out and moving out someday, right? That's a that's planned obsolescence. <laughs> I have five children. I speak from experience that we want our kids to grow up and move out. Um, I tell my wife in my business, my goal is is obsolescence. I want to be able to delegate everything and do just the things I love and that I'm good at and not have to deal with the accounting and the marketing and the social media, all the other things that I really don't enjoy and just focus on what I enjoy. That's what I'm talking about with fundraising. What if you could focus your time on that 80, 90% on the things you love and not have to spend so much time on the things you don't? It's a great book by a guy named Dan Martell called Buy Back Your Time. He talks about delegation. He talks about other things like that about how to make yourself obsolete. <laughs> I just had a conversation with a company yesterday about an executive assistant that could help take on more. I'll do your e handle my email, my calendar, my travel, just things like that. And so sometimes obsolescence is a good thing, and we need to look for ways to make improvement, make progress, right? It's intentional. I don't think it's fundraising um, that is is the problem. I think it's how we do it, right? There are stress points and challenges or failure points that make it harder than it has to be. In and of itself, it's a it's a noble work. It's an important work. But if we're still using a Betamax or a VHS when we could be using, we could be streaming our movies and we're missing something, right? There, there's a problem. And that's why we're trying to we're still trying to do things an old way, and it's it's exhausting. It can lead to burnout. Uh, I'd like to talk about three approaches that can change that and that can help. First, let's talk about how most of us are raising funds. Okay, I understand there's definitely some ways. Uh, just just understand there are definitely ways we can improve fundraising. We can make it easier. We can make it more effective. We can. Um, can even make it inspiring and fun, just like the rest of the work that goes on in the rest of the organization. Uh, but like I said, before I talk about the problems, let's talk about how most of us are doing. So we, we do have to have realistic expectations, right? There's this planned obsolescence, you know, now we're just somebody that you used to know. And uh, it happens, whether it's intentional or not. Um, but when it comes to fundraising, however we're doing it, 
we don't want to be obsolete. We don't want to be using an old system, a flawed system. We want to progress. At least I do. I, I, I try to constantly get better. I'm constantly trying to improve things. Well, how do we typically raise funds today? Okay, there's a lot of different ways, right? But the three, I mean, here's a whole list of, of challenges that people are, are dealing with when it comes to fundraising, right? Competition for funding, donor fatigue, limited resources, changing demographics. I, I won't go through the whole list because you guys know what they are. And I, 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 I do think that there's something to be said about, um, about understanding what the problems are before we can figure out how to, how to address them, how to resolve them. Anyway, so even those who do raise money professionally or have done so for a long time are pretty much limited to the same old boring diet in the wool approaches to, to raising funds or trying to raise funds for their cause. Historically, those have been three main approaches, right? We try to get grant money, which is exhausting because it's so uncertain. You have to write long applications. You have to pay some, or pay someone else to do it. It takes a long time. It's a waiting game and there's no guarantee. Uh, just yesterday, we talked with a, a clinic called Hope Clinic up in Minnesota. And they do, they do grants. And she was commenting on how she has to meet certain parameters with the state and requirements to qualify. And even that, you know, it's like the grants come with a, a price tag and they come with a, a which makes it really difficult. Uh, second thing you can do is you can sell stuff. Well, we've all done fundraisers, oftentimes for our kids. They consisted of car washes and bake sales and selling raffle tickets and chocolate bars. And while these do work, they raise money. It can be very trying. Grants can raise money. It can be very difficult. Uh, any sort of buy and sell program has two obvious challenges. One is you got to have money to buy this thing and then turn around and sell it usually. There's an investment up front. You're hoping to recoup and make a profit, and there's a lot of manpower that goes into it. And then the last approach, the most common, is to ask for donations. In short, uh, for someone else to give us a handout or a hand up, right? Whether that's individuals or groups or corporate sponsors or whatever, okay? Out of the goodness of their hearts to make a donation to our cause. Uh, it, 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 it's taking, it's relying on someone else's goodness or willingness for to look good or willingness for a tax, you know, tax deduction or something. It's relying on them to raise funding and it isn't fun. Um, I don't know about you, but doesn't it feel so much better to give than receive? Uh, it isn't so much more invigorating and encouraging to be the one making the donation versus the one asking for the donation. I mean, we doesn't it feel good to give a tithing at church or support a cause? It does not feel good. It's difficult, at least in my experience, and many would agree, to have to ask over and over right? And those are the challenges. Let's talk about some of the challenges with fundraising. What makes it so hard? What makes it so, so cumbersome or exhausting and oftentimes ineffective? Uh, I'm going to share with you three main challenges that I think exist, and I'm going to show you how we can solve them. The first challenge is um, really it's part ignorance and it's part effort. It's just, it's just that we don't know where to start. Right, or we're just using the old, broken, tried, not so true approaches. Right, and, and as a result, it's a lot of work. Okay, it takes a lot of time, and just isn't as effective as we wish it was. Um, don't get me wrong; it works. Right, some people do really well at it, but it's the old Pareto principle, the eighty twenty principle, where usually eighty percent of the funds in the industry are being raised by twenty percent of the people. A lot more of us struggle. A lot more of us are in that 80%. We, you might be a 20%er, but if you are, you're the exception. Most of us struggle. You want to hear what the most common phrase I hear from nonprofits is regarding fundraising? They say, I'm not a professional fundraiser. It's not what I am expert at. The bigger ones, yes, right? They'll hire someone who's done it for years and they consider themselves a professional. And they are, but they're still using the same old tried and true approaches, one of those three, right? 
um, that we just talked about. And so uh, either here, I'm not a professional pool or I have a limited pool or I'm not a professional fundraiser. I have a limited pool of people to draw from and uh, people give, but then they say that's all they have to give. And I, I, I get tired of asking the same people over and over and over. Uh, in fact, isn't it true that um, many donors, once they give, they are on your list, right? They're the ones you go to. They're the same people you see at galas over and over. They have a target on their back. One reason many people give um, anonymously is they don't want that target. But once they show up at one gala, they're, they're in a spotlight. That's the second dilemma. One is that it's hard and we don't really know where to start a lot of the time, especially if we're new to it. And the second is that we have to make these repetitive requests over and over and over and over of the same donors again and again. They see us coming and oftentimes run away or wish they could. <laughs> um, anybody out there agree with that? You can raise your hand or put a sh thumbs up. Um, I uh, most definitely have dealt with that and seen that. Um, there's a third dilemma. And this is a big one. I think the problem, it comes down to having to take versus give. Okay, I, I, I believe that we have it ingrained within us that it's a natural, inherent, God-given trait or characteristic that when we're asking for help or taking from others, it goes against the grain a little bit, right? It's a, it just feels foreign and unnatural. It feels forced. It weighs on us. It just feels so much better to give than receive. It's so much more fun, right? Uh, to, to give a gift of service or lend a hand than it is to ask for help. It's hard, right? A lot of us are, we struggle asking for help, whether it's a pride thing or the fact we just don't like to impose. It's really hard for us, uh, for most of us to ask for help. And, and when it's our job to do so, it can get really old really fast. So instead of being inspiring and uplifting, it can be draining and exhausting. Instead of looking forward to our work with anticipation, we often feel hesitation and even tribulation, right? Uh, at least that's the feedback I hear. And I've definitely felt that way myself as I've worked in fundraising over the years. So if you think salespeople have a hard time making cold calls or picking up the phone, you know, they talk about the phone weighing a hundred pounds, but I try being a fundraiser, right? Uh, and so you compare this feeling of taking or asking for help or even begging or pleading or cajoling or guilting people into to doing it, you fill in the blank. Um, I'm not saying this is how you should feel. I'm just saying it, it happens, right? We all feel that. I'm not trying to demean your work in any by any means. It's It's honorable and it is needed. I'm just saying that how a lot of us feel when it comes to asking for more donations is more negative than positive. It, it's a lot and it's, uh, it can be overwhelming. Um, so compare this to how we feel when we actually do the work our nonprofit provides, right? We're ser serving kids or veterans or helping rescue trafficking victims, saving wildlife or whatever the cause might be. You feel inspired and invigorated. It's, it's hard to feel tired. You work for hours. You just feel, Uplifted. Uh, I personally, I had the opportunity to uh, serve a full time mission for my church for several months. Uh, most returned missionaries that I speak with will say that it was the best two weeks or two months or two years of their life. And isn't that interesting? Uh, they dealt with exhaustion, maybe rejection, strange foods, living in a third world, less than ideal, often inhospitable living conditions. And they say it was unforgettable. Many times one of the best experiences of their life. Why in the world would they say that? I believe it's because for however long they were gone, they were thinking about someone other than themselves. They were looking outward, not inward. They were asking, how can I serve and make a difference uh, instead of what's in it for me? Right? I always say H... HCIC versus WFIM. How can I contribute versus what's in it for me? It's true. When we serve others, we just feel good, even when it's tiring. You just can't help it, right? It's one of the best ways to feel better if you're sick or depressed, go out and serve others. And so while we 
we may be ignorant and inex inexperienced starting out. I do believe ignorance on fire is important. It's a great quote from Dr. Meisner. Um, we don't want to be that guy or gal who's people see coming and is irritating and and uh, they don't want to talk to us. At repetitive requests, you know, over many requests, they get really old. We want to learn to give and not just take. Right? I found this other picture is life giving versus life taking. It fills us with energy versus drains our energy. But I want to make a really important point. This is one technique to feel better while you're fundraising is to remember why you're doing it. Right? Remember the cause behind it. Remember uh, in the midst of all the long hours or repetitive requests, the rejection, excuses, and more that you're working for a cause. It's one of the more important reminders while you're fundraising to remember why fundraising uh we have to do this in other areas of our business right we have to do it when we're starting a business or we're parenting or uh we're working on our relationships it's not always easy we just keep going right hopefully we, we don't give up uh, we know it's important well i'll know the divorce percentages in america are over 50 percent. a lot of us are giving up and it's sad but a lot of people eventually give up uh on fundraising too they just, uh, they say, I can't handle it. I can't handle not knowing where to start. All the hard work, the repetition, the cacophony of of constantly having to ask for help, having to give versus receive. They, they struggle with that. Even if they don't recognize it, it's why they're struggling. Um, it's not that they don't believe in the mission either. A lot of fundraisers will actually switch roles. They still want to work in nonprofit, so they switch to a different role within the organization uh, because they want to give and they want to serve, but they want to feel uplifted rather than weighed down. They want to give, not receive. They want to ask uh, rather than asking and taking uh, and feeling dejected or overwhelmed. They want to contribute. So it's very common. People who are in fundraising switch to a different role. They they, they don't want to leave the, the, the cause, but they don't want to fundraise anymore. So what's the solution? The first one, as I said, um, it is important to remember that the cause is important and that's why we do it, right? It's, it's, it's critical, but there's, but I want to share three reminders that can also help. And one of those, I believe guys, if you'll stick with me, can change everything you do. Okay. Um, the first is don't let yourself be a victim. I, I mentioned I was asked to write a chapter in a book called Mission Matters. And I wrote about accountability. I talked about this story. It's called The Oz Principle that talks about the characters in The Wizard of Oz. They're, they're traveling down the yellow brick road. They're going together. They're going to the Wizard of Oz, right? The great and powerful Oz in the Emerald City to do what? Well, they're going there to have him fix their problems for them. Now, as it turns out, they have all these different adventures. They work together as a team. And at the end, they realized that they had it within them to do it all along. They needed help. They helped each other. But in the challenging, scary situations, the lion showed courage. The, the scarecrow used his brain and figured out problems. The, the tin man obviously had a heart. He rested himself. He was so emotional a couple of times. And Dorothy, by the end of the story, realizes, comes to know, or comes to find out that she's been wearing the shoes the entire time that could take her home, the, the red slippers. Isn't that interesting? A lot of the time we are at a loss and we put ourselves in a victim stance. We say, it's not my job, or I don't know where to start, or I feel overwhelmed, or nobody will listen to me. These are all examples of us becoming a victim, allowing ourselves to be a victim. And so one of the first principles you've got to remember is don't let that happen. Don't be a victim. Keep asking yourself the question, what else can I do? And oftentimes it's need help. You need to talk to someone else for ideas or suggestions. You need to work with maybe a company like ours that can help you or an expert like Libby or a, a, a networking expert like Martin Hess, right? You need to collaborate and work in another. You need to see the problem, own it, and then go after it. So that's the first step. And so I, it's, I think you'll get, it's not as important maybe as the third one I'm going to share with you, but it is important. 
And if you understand that as the foundation, it helps with everything. Okay. Take ownership. Don't pass the buck. Don't make excuses. Don't blame it on anybody else. Take ownership. The second is to just like the characters in the Oz principle and the, uh, in the story of the Wizard of Oz, we've all read the book or seen the movie, is work together. Okay, when I talk about reaching out to Libby and and uh, Judy Clemente and Martin Hess, Liz Deal, these experts in this space, talk to them and pick their brains and collaborate, brainstorm together. Okay, it's always easier to work together. In my church, we help a lot of people move in and out. We just the other day helped a lady move who's moving from from here in Henderson, Nevada, where I live, to up to to Utah. She just she was a single mom, just got married, and we're all very happy for her, but we're sad to see her go. But we had about 40 people who showed up to help her move her moving truck. I was so impressed. I mean, and I always send a text out to everybody and say, can you come help? And many hands make light work. And fortunately, we got a lot, we got a great turnout. And she had a lot of stuff, so it was a good thing. But but so don't forget teamwork. Don't forget that you're not alone. You might feel alone. You might feel overwhelmed, but you are not alone. Even if you are alone in your company or your organization, just coming to, to uh, presentations like this one, you're part of a family, right? The nonprofit family, you're part of a community. And people like Libby have created opportunities for you to not be alone and to learn. Um, we have figured out that we can do much more by extending our reach as a company by partnering with other resellers. Okay. We don't sell nearly as much as we, as the organizations, the groups, the associations, the influencers and others that we've met and that we work with because they have a reach that we don't have. They have connections and relationships we don't have. We keep learning, right? We keep networking, but we try to rely on others' efforts as well. We get to know people who can not only donate to our causes, but also help us in different ways. And so who are you surrounding yourselves with? Who are you reaching out to for introductions, for awareness, for lobbying, maybe even legislation? Are you expanding your team? It's a second question. Are you just focusing on those same donors over and over and over? Or are you finding new ones? We all know that it's not usually what we uh, what we know; it's who we know. And I tell myself, I tell my people all the time, it's not usually what uh, they know or even who they know; it's who those people know. You might be two, three, four degrees of separation away from someone who could change your stars. And so, are you expanding your community and your team? Are you getting out there and meeting new people? Or are you just trying to go with the same old regulars? It's kind of like uh, with existing donors, that pool that we have. It's like we're tapping on their foreheads and give me some more money. Can you imagine how irritating that could be? And that's what we're doing more often than not. So I'm a, I'm a fly fisherman. Okay, I, I enjoy fishing. I've grown up, I've fished all my life. I speak from experience. I've caught a lot of fish in my life and I catch a lot and let them go. Every now and then I bring one home and we have salmon or, or trout or whatever. But the one thing I'll tell you about me is I don't like lake fishing. In most cases, I'm fishing on a river. I mean, I do, I do fish on a boat and in the ocean sometimes. Like, in fact, both of these pictures were on that. But my very favorite kind of fishing is on a small creek, my fly rod where I'm hiking up the stream, hitting all the holes. And I love it because I get to try another hole, then another hole, then another hole, then another hole. I get additional opportunities, new opportunities to try to find a fish. And it's um, it's key to how I like to fish, for one thing, but it's also key because I don't get bored. I don't like sitting in one spot. I'm not just waiting for a fish to buy, hoping something comes along. It's kind of how it feels when you're you're fishing from the same pool or calling on the same donors, doing the same things and doing them over and over. If you're not trying new approaches and meeting new people, it's kind of like you're fishing on a lake versus fishing in a creek. It's like you're waiting for a fish to come along rather than going after them. 
um, to a very real degree, this is a numbers game. And the more numbers you find, the better. And I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. But what would happen if I tried fishing without any bait, if I threw my line out with no fly or worm or salmon eggs on it, when I catch, would I catch many fish? I wasn't offering value of some kind or some kind of hook, right? some kind of en en enticement. Um, it's kind of like how we're fundraising many times. We're throwing out a hook and hoping people hook on and come back. We're not giving them any value in return. Okay, we're doing good work, important work. We need your help. And so we're telling them we, we think that our cause is enough. How many out there who are fundraising think that just because you're doing important work, it's enough for someone to give you funding? I'm telling you, it is not. To some degree, it may be, and it is important, but it is not enough to get significant funding coming in. I believe you have to give value, significant value, in order to generate significant funding. And there's a good people out there, right? There's good companies who want to make a difference, or if nothing else, they want uh, the recognition or the tax write-off, like I said. But to me, waiting on those people to hook onto my hook is kind of like throwing my hook out with no bait on it with no value added and hoping something gets snagged. I lived in Alaska for six years. And when I lived there, we did, we did go fishing like that. Sometimes there's a place on the Kenai Peninsula called the Russian river. And we would throw our lines out with these big coho hooks and we just let it float downstream and it would hook into salmon's mouths. I mean, they weren't, they weren't biting it. They weren't trying to eat it. They were just going upstream and we hooked them and pulled them in. And it didn't feel very honorable, and it wasn't nearly as gratifying as presenting a perfect fly with a perfect lie and seeing that fish bite it. All right, the two are very different feeling experiences. I believe that when we just ask for donations, grants, and things like that, we're throwing out a hook and hoping to catch a sucker while offering, offering nothing of return or, or nothing of value in return. And this is my third point, and I, I think it's the most important one. My business partner is a radio host like me. I'm a radio host on Voice of America Business. We each have a weekly show, and his favorite topic is reciprocity. His name is Frank Hellring, and his show is called The Business Buzz. My show is called Finding Certainty. He says all the time, he says, what if instead of just asking for help, you ask yourself, what else can I or what can we together, all of us, do to give, not just receive? How can I make it fun and uplifting and not feel like a grind? How can I make it expansive and abundant so that the repetitive nature of fundraising doesn't feel like it's repetitive? It actually feels engaging and attractive and you know, rather than irritating and mundane, right? How can I infuse service and contribution into my work and give more than I receive? This was the question we asked ourselves and it really changed our entire paradigm. Uh, let me back up just briefly. I know we're running out of time, but I'll tell you our story. We're a, we are a veteran-owned profit consulting firm. We help companies create funding. We help them find dollars that didn't exist. It wasn't in their budget yesterday. Today it is. We call them hidden revenue or found dollars. And... Uh, we refer to ourselves as profitability funding and benefit strategists. In short, we help our company, or we help our customers to make more and keep more. We actually thought about starting our own nonprofit because we do want to do good, not just business. We wanted to do more than just make income, but make a difference. I was talking with a nonprofit in Utah once, a company a organization named Operation Underground Railroad, and I was showing them some of the things we could do to reduce their costs and help them recover some funds and get a tax credit that's available to them and some things like that. We were sitting up on this, this cafe looking out over Utah Valley. And this was his idea. I wish I could take credit for it, but he said, Patrick, he said, I think you're missing the boat. He said, I think you're, 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 I said, I can see how you could help us in these ways and maybe save us a little bit and get us some funding. He said, but I think you're you're touching 1% of that iceberg. 
He said, I think you could use what you're good at to raise unlimited funding for us and others like us. He was, his name was Gary McIntosh. He was the development director with Operation Underground Railroad for a long time. They're a great anti-sex trafficking organization. But, but he said, why not help several instead of just one? Why not just, not just help them with what you do, but help them with what you could do for people they know? He says, why not use what you're good at to not just save and recover funding, but also raise funding? And um, that is what evolved into our program called the Certainty Partners Program. It's based on this principle of reciprocity that my partner, Frank, my, my good friend, Frank, talks about all the time. Um, basically means that we each bring value to the table. We each bring a piece of the pie. Instead of just asking for a donation from a donor, who's probably a business owner or a civic leader or someone like that, but we're saying we we have value that we can bring you, and it can actually create good for your organization and for us. One of the best examples is on this Zoom with us. Martin Hess is the founder of American Club Association. Since I first met Martin, and every single time I'm with him, he says, I need to introduce you to so-and-so. And immediately, he puts together a mutual introduction email. He says, I need to introduce you to so-and-so. And before we're done, within minutes, I've gotten introduced to this other person who, not that can help Martin, but who can help me. So Martin is a phenomenal example of what I'm talking about. His whole organization teaches this principle of giving before you receive. He's not going to people and saying, who, who do you know that you can give me? Who can you refer to me? He's saying, I've got somebody I need to refer to you. And he's built this amazing organization. That's actually why I, how I met Libby was through ACA, how Liz and I um, got involved, this deal, because of his example of this principle, give before you ask. Contribute more than you take. So what we do is we, we work with customers and clients that are referred to us by the nonprofits that we work with. And we go in and we find hidden dollars for them. We have seven different divisions, several different ways we can do that. There's zero upfront and out-of-pocket costs, and we get paid out of the savings. We then donate 50% of our commission back to the nonprofit who introduced us. Maybe they introduced us to a church or a city or a university or business. We give 50% of our commission back to the nonprofit. And get this, we also invite the customer to match our donation. And we do the same with their referrals. What this does is it creates, rather than a, a hard ask or a repetitive, maybe even irritating ask for money, you're going to a donor and saying, what if we could put money back in your pocket? Would you be willing to donate a portion of it over here? What if we could create that money for you? Any reason you wouldn't be interested. It's a pretty easy time to ask someone for uh, a donation if you're just created $200,000 in their budget for them. Okay, it becomes this residual expanding major gift endowment that could continue to come in and, and continue to grow for many, many years to come. So, so back to my example of funding in your sleep, this could create that with a little bit of work. Imagine people, imagine being able to, say to people, I'm not asking for your money, but I am asking for your help. Maybe someone who's given in the past and you want to say, we really appreciate your help. We, thank you so much for supporting us in the past. I'd like to repay the favor. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of ours who can create funding for you. And if, if they do, it's going to benefit us as well. Say we give 50% of whatever we, uh, of, of our commission on the job. That's the part we can guarantee. Um, introduce us to a business, a city, a, a school. We, we can do the work. And it's an easy ask because there's no upfront cost to them. They don't have to switch vendors. We create funding. We recover dollars. There are millions of dollars hiding out there. We know how to recover their share. And we donate 50% of our commission on that job back to you. But again, we ask them to match our donation. Well, we can't guarantee that part. But usually, if they're already a fan of yours, maybe been a donor in the past, they already support you, it's pretty easy ask because they already care. 
And oftentimes it can create a residual for you in two ways. One, because they continue to donate based on the savings they continue to get. And they also refer us to others. And we go, when we go do the work for others, we donate 50% of that back to you. And we ask them to match that donation as well. So how many other businesses could do what we do? I think there's sales organizations all over the country who could do what we're doing. Working together with you, you're helping them with your relationships. They're helping you with their clientele, their employees, their, their needs as a business. We're helping them with our expertise. We're all bringing a third of that pie. We're all bringing a piece of the pie. We're all bringing something valuable. And in the process, we can change lives. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. There's so many ways we can do good, and it creates ripple effects that can be worth millions. Remember our three dilemmas, not knowing where to start? Well, before we were alone and overwhelmed, working long, exhausting hours. With this approach, we're in it together. We're working as a team. We're each bringing value, our own slice of the pie. It is truly a team effort. Uh, we're collaborating together to make a difference. We're lightening each other's loads. We're just like with my friend the other night when we helped her move, we all won. That was the beauty of it. We loved serving. We didn't have to do it alone because a lot of people showed up and she got the help she needed. With the re repetition dilemma, it's different when you're giving versus receiving or serving versus stocking or it's different with empowerment versus entitlement, deposits versus demands. Re repetition isn't an irritation at all when it's a positive repetition. At the very least, we're asking for their help, but not their way. We're asking for partnership, not patronage. We're, we're asking for collaboration. These are two very different things. Rather than feeling like we're tapping on their forehead, it feels like we're giving them a high five and a, hug, and a big bear hug, right? It's engaging. There are a lot of good things that are repetitive, after all. Um, I mean, think about compliments, back rubs, a lover's touch, you know, royalties. <laughs> there, there are a lot of good things that are repetitive. They just are usually coming to us, not being taken from us. And the last one is giving and receiving. We've all been in relationships where it felt like we were doing all the giving and the other person was doing all the taking. It's old after a while. My 20 year old son called me the other day just to talk and I about fell off my chair. <laughs> he didn't ask me for money. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure what to think. I asked him if he was okay. He surprised me. It was refreshing. Don't take me wrong. I love my son, but he's a struggling college student. He's broke. He usually calls and asks me for money. And imagine what it would feel like if he had called me and said, hey, dad, I spoke to my college the other day, and they want to talk to you about your program for free benefits for all their employees. He goes, how do we set up a meeting? I mean, after I picked myself up off the ground, I'd feel I'd, I'd be so impressed and appreciative, even proud, if he were to do that. I'd want to help him even more because he brought me value before he asked me for a handout, before he asked me for something. That's the, that's probably the most important principle of this entire presentation, guys. These reciprocal ripple effects. Call it a domino effect or a mushroom. It's like a snowball rolling down the hill. It gets bigger and bigger. It becomes like a fire burning. My son is, my youngest son is in Oregon fighting wildfires. Well, they start with a spark and they grow into a blaze same principle applies to this. As I said, even when you ref if you refer us to someone, we do the work for them and they refer us to someone, we donate 50% of that commission too. We encourage them to match your donation. That creates awareness because now they know who you are. They may become a donor in and of themselves. They may want to help support. And if those referrals refer us to referrals to referrals, it can be become this residual expanding effect. In closing, this is the perfect rebuttal. When someone says, we'd love to donate, we just can't. We're, we're coming out of the pandemic, recovering from COVID-19, or we've given everything we can this year. Call us back next year. I mean, this is this is the, the litany we hear on a daily basis as fundraisers, right? But if you can say, hey, no problem. Are you, if you're serious about wanting to contribute, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. They can help your business in some very big ways. In the process, it'll help us too. That's all I ask. Just if you'd be willing to meet with them, they're not going to ask you for any money. We'll actually put it back in your pocket. 
could be a very large amount. It's a pretty good litmus test to see if they're serious or not, right? If it was just a smoke screen or they really do want to help you, if they do want to help you, if they care about you, they should be open to hearing us out. A lot of examples like this. I mean, Amazon Smile was an example. It's kind of gone away. There's a new one coming out called Einstein Cares. We heard about recently here on the on the on the on the Zoom with Libby. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of ways we can think outside the box, but we have to fix it. IKEA, who we all know, said planned obsolescence is not okay with us. It's gone on for too many years. We're going to become what we call a circular company instead. What they mean by that is they're creating a business that reuses things, refurbishes them, remanufactures them, and recycles them. They decided that planned obsolescence was not acceptable. They weren't okay with it. And um, they're, make, they're working to make a difference. Well, I believe that the old form of fundraising is not acceptable. It's not good enough. It's, our, it's as old is a Betamax or a v VHS or an 8-track tape. We don't use those anymore. We've progressed. So let's progress in fundraising as well. Uh, we shouldn't be okay with the status quo, just like Ikea said. They're not okay. Just like our divorce rate. We really need to do things different. We may feel alone. It may be hard work. It may be repetitive. Sometimes it's mundane. But just like in a marriage, we keep going. At least we should. One of the challenges is we mistake that we are in it alone, which we're not. We need to expand our team, as I said. One of the solutions is learn to give more than we receive. Same thing applies in marriage, applies in our parenting. Ask ourselves, how can I contribute versus what's in it for me? By the way, speaking of marriage, I will say this. I highly, highly recommend if you're struggling to read a book called Real Love by Greg Bear. In closing, my hope is that Together, we can reinvent fundraising. We can make it easier and invigorating and far more effective. I know that we can do it. We can, we can do more good. In the process, we can change the world. Both sides of your business can be uplifting and inspiring and fun, both the work side and the fundraising side. Um, if you want to learn more, you can reach out to us at certaintyteam.com. Our phone number is 888-684-3122. Or you can listen to my weekly radio show at certaintyteam.live. Libby, thanks for having me. Sorry I went a couple minutes over, but it's a lot to talk about, and um, it's an important topic. I know you guys are trying out there. I know you're working hard. If you will learn to give first, I promise you it will change your work. You start with an idea. If you do something with it, it becomes reciprocal. And it can change everything. So that's it in a nutshell. Thanks for having me, Libby. I hope that was uh, insightful.